Hi guys, it is a gray, gloomy day here in the collapse of global industrial civilization here in the great state of Texas here in the middle of March 2020. What a time to be alive uh, on the planet this week. And my name is Sam Mitchell and this is Collapse Chronicles. And I cannot think of a better day. Well, I guess we're one day late uh, here on March 18th, the day after probably the quietest St. Patrick's Day in a while. Uh, we're going to go all the way across the pond over to Ireland, where I have the long overdue uh, honor and pleasure and the perfect timing, I might add, to speak with uh, David Kuravich. I'm hoping I got that right, David. For those of you who are not familiar with David, I just read uh, an essay of his that we're going to be diving into uh, a few days ago. But more than that, David Kuravich is Director of Risk and Response at the Geneva Global Initiative. His work is aimed at encouraging and supporting large-scale preparedness and contingency planning for intensifying large-scale systemic risks. He argues we are on the cusp of an inevitable major social societal transformation that will largely outrun our capacity to manage or control. The implications will be prolonged and severe. We can choose to face such consequences head on and work to support what's best in our human story in times that threaten to expose the worst. Understanding, anticipation, and preparedness is part of this. And part of what uh, David has a long history of is, um, is looking at global pandemics among other things. David has been a pioneer in drawing upon ideas from fields such as ecology, complexity, and systems science to shed light on emergent risks, vulnerabilities, and uncertainties. He has written influential studies on the financial and socioeconomic implications of a peak in global oil production, the propagation of financial and monetary shocks through trade networks and critical infrastructures, and do not forget pandemic shocks and the limits to growth. So there you go. So David, come on and say hello to the folks, and we're going to dive right in to this rousing conversation. Delighted to be with you, Sam, and uh, indeed all the listeners. Okay, obviously, uh, David, I, I just finished a paper that David wrote several years ago about uh, pretty much predicting what it would look like, uh, Not, I guess not if, but when a global pandemic was to come blowing through our global industrial society. I, I must say, uh, David, that was... That was the most prophetic paper I have written going into an, uh, that I have read going into an interview. So like I've been doing all week, guys, we're going to start off with this question. Then I'm going to leave my outline behind and we're just going to let David uh, take, us, take us down the trail of where coronavirus is leading us. But we're going to start out with this overall question to start off this conversation. So, David, in your opinion, could coronavirus be the trigger for the beginning of the end of global industrial civilization, and why or why not? Well, I think the first thing I'd say is I don't know if it is, um, but I think if you take a little step back and say, what is the context, firstly, in which the coronavirus is impacting the world? 
Well, it's a context in which our societies have become, as they've become ever more tightly bound together and interdependent and high speed and connected, we're really part of a global organism. And that, in a sense, shows in one, why we are vulnerable, and we can come back to that in a moment. And the second thing is, that is already stressed. So we have a situation where we have a huge amount of uh, indebtedness globally, and this that is already a vulnerability. And of course, the implications of the coronavirus on society is compounding that vulnerability or that that stress. Uh, okay, we also then, have a situation I, I, I need where to interrupt. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I need mm-hmm. to interrupt you just a minute. We are still getting this uh, this this sound interference. It's not ruining everything, but maybe if you could just back off the computer microphone just a couple sure. of feet and see how... How about that? How about this? Uh, okay, let's let's try this because I really want people to understand uh, every word you're saying here. Okay, keep on. Okay, so one is we're already vulnerable and that's part of the structure of society, how we live, why there's food in the supermarkets, the lights are on. There is work, we have money, all of these things that we take for granted, and we take them for granted because it's been so stable, it works. Um, But it's been recognized increasingly now, and certainly uh, in these recent months, that this structure, this system, can be vulnerable in certain situations. And the other thing I mentioned is it's already stress with indebtedness, within polarization within countries and between countries. So that sort of collective action or will is harder to muster both to deal with a crisis and to potentially say how we might respond to a future crisis. So that is a context in which it's happening. Um, and how big will the shock be from the coronavirus? Well, there's an inherent uncertainty. The first uncertainty is how long it stays around, and it's it just purely on those impacted directly in terms of health and those who uh, are impacted, the impact on uh, society from the shutdowns and lockdowns and all of the other things. Um, so it could be, I mean, we, we've seen people talking of peaks falling and rising within a few months. But there's plenty of opportunity for these sort of things to go on for a long time. So there might be outbreaks here and new outbreaks here and there. And so I think this is something that could be around until we get a vaccine in some form or other. It can come in waves or in certain places at certain times. So that's an uncertainty. And it's very clear that it's causing sort of Forget the financial system for a moment, because that has related uh, issues, but just the normal effects on society. It is uh, people are attracting from work. People are distancing themselves. So whole parts of the service industries, which are very important for economies, especially developed economies around the world, they're effectively stopped. Um, there's a myriad of things which you can see around. I mean, it's, it's being reported upon. There are, so that means, of course, lots of fall in demand, falls in income. It means suppliers aren't being paid for things, etc. So there's a huge demand shock. You know, so we, we, we want less, partially because we can't access things. But that's going to evolve in the coming weeks and months into a further demand constraint, why? Well, then, because people won't have money and businesses may not have money because they may become bankrupt or whatever. So there's a big demand shock. There's a supply shock. So we see that through supply chains from here and there and um, where a factory can't produce something. So an output can't be produced and it might be a final output, like something you buy at home. But it could be, and may very well be, part of the intermediate processes in our industrialized global system, so that you can have sort of this contagion effect. 
Um, so there's the supply, there's the demand, and of course it is hitting um, an unstable financial system. Now, this financial system would have been unstable irrespective of uh, the impact of the coronavirus because it's been hugely indebted. There was a little interruption in 2007 and 8, but it's continued growing in indebtedness. Um, and as you see, I mean, I'm looking from a distance of the, the United States. Clearly, there are political problems in responding promptly and efficiently to this crisis. Um, and that is a problem of polarization, of entrenched things. And, you know, that's not the fault of the coronavirus, the impacts. But what that did is it exposed those sort of vulnerabilities that were building there already. So when we, when we see this sort of cluster, so we, we see these multiple effects, which is pretty extraordinary. It's not like a credit crisis that we had in 2008. Um, it has other layers all over it. And crucially, um, I think it is, it is now happening in a way that's globally synchronized. In other words, whether you're in Europe or the United States, whether you're in Southeast Asia, all of these things are happening at more or less the same time. So that means, in effect, not only is the shock hitting lots of different parts and facets of the economy, it's happening at a huge scale from different directions. So uh, the magnitude of what the shock is uh, like unprecedented, at least in living memory. Um, the uncertainty about the virus and how potential further pandemic waves happen, uh, the uncertainty about what it's doing to the financial system. You'll see there's a lot of emergency uh, work in the United States, in, well, belatedly, I think, in Europe or the European Central Bank. Um, but it's very clear we're in the edges of a financial crisis, um, a, a very dangerous one. Um, so we could turn around and say, wow, our problem here is, will this collapse civilization? Will it not? Well, in a sense, you know, maybe it's the wrong question to ask because we don't know whether it's full of uncertainties and whether you're the most brilliant modeler or anything else. A lot of these uncertainties are pretty fundamental. You don't know all the myriad interactions that could happen. Um, and you don't know what will be happening in six months. I mean, uh, you know, are we going to get another food spike because of the effects of the coronavirus, West Nile, uh, the locusts in Africa, and maybe something to do with climate change? We just don't know. So we are in a more volatile world, and we're in a world where um, there are there is a growing potential for both downside uncertainty and downside risk. Now that just means that. You know, if I were to say to you, will next year be better or worse than this year? You know, more likely it will be worse. And five years out, more likely it will be worse. It doesn't mean, though, that there's not a chance that you know, the economy will rebound and it'll go up for a few more years, etc. And um, so that, you know, in, in, in real essence, I think we're in a period of destabilization. Um, and concurrent with that, there is a growing risk of large-scale systemic pain and what you might call collapse. So both of those could be, and, and other things can be all part of the potential of what we can expect. It's just that the potential for intensifying destabilization is growing, and the potential for large-scale systemic failure is growing, and the potential for a return to prolonged growth, that's declining. That sort of probability of that. So we can look at it in that form. And in a sense, I know people sometimes sort of say, well, when is the moment that we go down? In a sense, if you know, from real sort of systems thinking, you'd say, well, those sort of things are really a bit impossible to predict. And um, you just know if it's getting hotter or colder and how uh, maybe probabilities are changing. Um, so the real thing is, I would, I would say, as I'd say to um, anybody I talk to, really the issue isn't necessarily about precise timing. 
or um, what will be the trigger. It really should be about one way or another, we have a declining window of opportunity to do any preparedness we need to do. Um, and that should be the focus. So if nothing too bad happens in five years, that's five years to work with. If nothing too bad happens in 10 years, that's 10 years to work with. If nothing, if we go over a cliff towards the end of the year, well, you know, we got to work with work on where we are with what we have. So that's how I kind of broadly uh, contextualize it. Okay, so now I, I, I know you have written quite a bit and it's certainly on the minds of a lot of people is is how long this is going on. For, for, for example, what happened in Austin, Texas yesterday is they just blanketly announced uh, that all restaurants and bars in Austin, Texas, we're, we're the live music capital of the world. We have a huge, huge restaurant, bar, nightclub, live music industry uh, in, in, in this town. We are right in the middle of what's supposed to be South by Southwest Music Festival. So for this week alone, Austin, Texas is losing $350 million out of the local economy because of the South by Southwest closure. And now they're talking, that they picked this arbitrary date of May 1st. No going to restaurants or bars or hearing live music in the live music capital of the world until May 1st. And so everyone is asking, so what does that mean for May 2nd? Uh, just address uh, th th this whole notion of, uh, of, of how, when some, whether it's coronavirus or anything else, when trying to respond to this, how 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 do you respond to something that is so unknown when we're in uncharted territory? What 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 are the options? Well, I mean, this is this is why famously William Catton talked about these things as a predicament. Um, you know, he and he contrasted that with a problem. A problem has a solution. Now, it might be a difficult solution, it might be the one you want to do, but there is a solution in some form. The position broadly we're in now is we just got to deal with rubbish options and try to make choices that are better rather than worse for society or for societal welfare. Um, and it's highly uncertain environment, and that's intrinsic, you know, because so many different things are interacting. Um, and there's a temporal uncertainty. In other words, it's hard to say, well, maybe, you know, everything will, you'll have a, a crisis um, for a couple of months and then the, over and down the peak and things will be all right. You'll be back to having your music capital and all of that. But we don't know because there might be another peak or other things could happen in the interim. So um, that is, in a sense, you know, the predicament we're in, that this is high impact, high uncertainty, and it's prolonged. And crises generate their own crises. So um, I feel a lot for, you know, if we sort of, for, for people who are kind of working, you know, in insecure jobs as musicians or as, you know, working in bars and restaurants where, you know, they lose their job. They're not the most necessarily the highest paid jobs. So, and we also know that a large percentage of people in the United States really have a very small cushion um, of, for loss of earnings. I heard something like, you know, um, a majority of Americans couldn't, don't have more than something like $400 in savings. Um, so if something does not get to... Uh, come back to that, if money doesn't get to a huge part of the US population um, pretty soon uh, there will be huge impacts because a large number of people will start to be unable to start paying for food, for rent and that will sort of ripple through all sorts of things. Now I know that they're talking about the Federal Reserve effectively it 
you've probably heard the phrase helicopter money, so putting money in everybody's account. Um, and that would be a powerful and useful thing to do at this moment. Um, but it's not the it, 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 it deals with a crisis of the moment and part of the problem, but it doesn't deal with all the economic impacts. So, in other words, you know, you can give lots of people a thousand, two thousand dollars, um, but if they're all staying at home and social distancing, they might spend it a little bit at the supermarket. But, you know, they're not going to be spending as much one way or another. And that's, you're not going to be out shopping or going buying clothes and all of the normal things uh, that would enable money to circulate. So, you know, that's one type of risk. You try and address that. But the, the real thing is it's a much broader predicament. There's lots of things happening. Um, and if I were, which I'm doing a little bit at the moment, if, I, if you were to say, well, how do you deal with this? How do you plan all of this? Well, in one sense, governments do have plans. Now, for most governments, those plans will have been things written by a bunch of civil servants and put up in shelves saying, in case of pandemic, pull this out. And it gives instructions. But we don't know if it's how often it's been exercised, meaning they've run through... Uh, in a, some sort of scenario of what they would do and get a sense of it. Um, but, you know, that's pulled out and there's what to do. But this, these sort of things are, you know, real life is always more different than anything you can ever exercise or plan for. It brings its own contingencies or surprises. And particularly this, you know, because we live in such a complex network world, because it's interacting with global indebtedness and... Uh, an oil price war and all of these other things and um, there's a huge amount of uncertainties so if you were to be if, if, if you were like me to sort of say we should take more pay more attention to downside risks and generally I might refer those to deepening destabilization number one which is basically uh, unemployment rises uh, the Growth starts yeah, slowing down, and there are more shocks, and wealth and infrastructure is declining, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and that would be for a period, and that would lead to, at some point, some sort of systemic failure because it becomes so frazzled it can no longer hold itself together, and boom, it loses its uh, coherence and structure. Do you think and, what we're seeing in, in general society is an indication of, of what that's going to look like? It is what's going... I, I don't know what the scene is in Ireland. I am utterly flabbergasted on how the situation here in Austin, Texas, which I think in the state of Texas and a state of 40 million people or something, there's... There's uh, 58 confirmed cases. What I uh, of this so far, the absolute panic buying, the the supermarket shelves being stripped bare right here in the middle of the capital of the state of Texas, the gun sales, the ammo sales, uh, based on what some people might consider. Uh, in and of itself, a fairly small uh, shock to to the whole system. Do you think what we're seeing is is a snapshot uh, of what we are going to see a lot more of as more and more of these systemic shocks uh, start hitting us over the course of the 21st century? Or is is this a drill that we are failing miserably? Um, well, what we know of is, you know, hum if humans learn anything, it's generally through being exposed to a crisis. We're pretty often anticipating things. Um, so this is how we learn. So I know that FEMA got a lot better after Hurricane Katrina because it was it, its failures were so blatant and exposed. So that's the way with institutions and that's the way with people. Um, sometimes people anticipate prepare, but as a society as a whole, it's generally um, needs doses of hard reality to um, 
reflect and adapt. Uh, so some of the things we're saying, I mean, you know, what we know in any crisis, you know, um, in broad terms, some people retract, i.e. sort of bunker mentality, get your tins, get your tins and guns and everything else. And you see external to you as a threat or you sort of adopt that pose. And then there is another way. Now these are, yeah, we can all have bits and pieces of both. And then there's another side, which is you kind of go, I can't deal with this alone. But if I am in a larger group or network or community, and um, together we can achieve types of security that we couldn't if we were just in a bunker um, with a few people. So, so both of those tendencies are there, and we're certainly seeing it in around us at the moment. So what I'm seeing, at least in Ireland, and I'm sure it's happening in the US and all sorts of in other places, is there's lots of people saying, well, what can I do? There's people setting up... Uh, groups to ensure old people are looked after and have their shopping, etc., etc. All sorts of positive pro-social actions. And of course, there are people kind of running to the supermarkets and all of that. Some of that, I think, is um, you know I mentioned before that you know we've lived in a very stable society and our security is taken for granted. You know that. You know, there is food, there is, you know, relative peace, there is, things are familiar, things, patterns form, patterns um, are, you know, it allows us to live in the world, in a complex world, is regularity. And suddenly that's sort of shocked. And I think for some people, that sort of thing that you would like laugh at, like the ludicrous over toilet roll volume, I think is just a stress reaction. Um, people are psychologically a bit traumatized and disorientated about it and they need to regain control over the situation that seems to be you know a response to it and just toilet roll so um, but that just seems to be a stress reaction and um, for a loss of control and disorientation and then there are other people who just like will buy up loads of food um, and that's that sort of inward one, like, I'll get it all for myself before anybody else does. But of course, our supply chains aren't really set up for that sort of um, just behavioral discontinuity or behavioral change. So we can see, like, all of these reactions are there. They were there before, they're part of us. And as we have a more unstable future, destabilized future, you know, there's the potential for all of them to be there as well. And um, my general view is that uh, we're, we're better off reaching out. And when the instinct or fear is to pull back, you know, that we recognize it and say, is this useful? Because in truth, most of us are pretty useless on our own. Um, you know, this sort of idea that, you know, I will just go and find five acres and farm it um, is a measure, I think, of, which kind of one here is go to the country, grow food, is a measure of our distance from actual farming. Because growing food like you need to live on it throughout the year is incredibly high skilled especially if you're not getting inputs and you're living in a changing climate, etc., etc., we're going to need cooperative networks because we are pretty useless. And so my general encouragement is, yeah, we need to find ways of preparing together so that we are better prepared to deal with sort of a destabilizing uh, socioeconomic and indeed ecological environment. So do you think humans are going to, uh, to learn anything from, from this uh, hopefully fairly small uh, interruption to their lives? Or is once it, once it blows over and coronavirus just, just takes its place so alongside Lyme's disease and cancer and heart disease and the flu and just becomes one more saber-toothed tiger outside the cave, uh, are we going to learn anything from this? Are we, are we just going to go right back 
to right. to doing everything wrong, uh, which is only going to get us back to a, a, something worse than coronavirus. Well, are you, are you going to try to second guess uh, whether humanity is going to learn a yeah. lesson from this? Well, I, I think as I said, the first thing is I think we've already slipping into an age of destabilization. So I think. This will be a big psychological shock in all sorts of ways for people. And I don't, I, yeah, my feeling is we're not going to come out of it very easily. And we could go the other way and start to, you know, find very difficult to recover. I don't know, but my feeling is that. In other words, um, this shock will, in some form, even after the virus sort of becomes just background noise, we will be in a much more perilous socioeconomic environment one way or another. Um, so I think we, this will probably, for most people being, will be where we learned that we are vulnerable. So that's the first big lesson. Um, that government, because a lot of people think, you know, you know, government have these things sorted, at least at some level. Um, and it will be where people will realise that, you know, things can happen that are bigger than government. Uh, things can happen that really hurt. Um, and that... I think that throw your life in a worm. You know, so even people I know who've been working on large-scale risks of you know, grid failure or pandemics, you know, are still saying, or saying to, we're saying to each other now, wow, this all feels very surreal, or it's like we're in a movie. So we're, we're all, in a sense, struggling to cross that bridge between uh, our habitual lives and expectations and this changing world around us. Um, and, you know, in a sense, we're in a processing stage of that. But we're also, so how we, whatever we take from this, some people are hopefully will take the stories of how people cooperated and worked together and uh, were able to create things in rapid time. Um, others, it'll probably make them go, oh my, you know, oh my, I better... Um, yeah, prepare for much worse and retreat into themselves. So these things will be there. I think, uh, and we really don't know. There are so many, cons you know, so many potential consequences. But um, I think it will expose our failure to be prepared, and that is true. I think in the United States, it's true in Ireland. Um, in every, virtually every other country, because these are risks that were well known. I mean, people have been warning about pandemics for a long time. Uh, people run exercises. People, you know, or, you know, there's big, relatively big funding going into, um, you know, getting countries to prepare. But of course, it's always been a difficult one as well. So when out when there was Ebola or SARS, government said, oh, you yeah, know, this is really important. We've got to put money into preparing for this. And, you know, and while it's in the media, governments pledge money to put more into general academic or pandemic preparedness. And then, of course, it dies down. SARS dies down and everybody sort of forgets the pledges they made. And we all go back to our normalcy, normal world. So this is exposing, firstly, that bad things really do happen. And often we're warned about them. It's not that they're obscure, that they come out of nowhere. But we haven't prepared properly. And it also shows um, that governments and societies can be totally disorientated. Things can happen that is beyond their capacity to manage. So we don't often assume somebody will manage things, and this can be overwhelming. Now, I think out of that, you get this picture of, oh, what would you do? And there, I think, part of it will have to be, if it's to be more functional, is that we say, use this crisis to say, is there something we can do now that would make us better able to deal with bigger crises in the future? 
And part of that, to my mind, is a whole of society preparedness approach, where um, you know, the rescuing or the retrieval of a situation or the dealing with the shock is, we don't, we don't assume government, federal or state or regional government is where the responsibility lies. In other words, there is a crisis, we do a few things and then in come the professionals, fix the problem or hopefully fix the problem. Um, and depart and life goes on, rather we see it as, you know what, all citizens have a role in making their communities, their lives, their cities more resilient um, and you know, better able to, uh, as citizens, respond to crises because there may be situations where um, you know, government just is overwhelmed, and I think that's the case. Will be the case um, in the coming months. Well, certainly, so, with the, 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 the health. I mean, uh, certainly, no one can deny at this point, uh, except maybe a politician looking for re-election. Uh, uh, other than if you're not a politician looking to be re-elected next fall, you cannot claim on any level that uh, the government response has been a pro that it's exposed the, the, the government, whatever that word means, as completely incompetent. A, a bunch of keystone cops for Donald Trump to get up there and give himself a 10 point out of a 10 point rating of, of how he and uh, he and the government are responding uh, to, to this is it's, it's, it's patently absurd. So, do, do you agree with me that they that a lot more people are going to come out of this with, with uh, less faith in the government than they than they've ever had before? Is that a safe statement or well, debate me on that? Uh, it, it's, an, it's an interesting thing because it's also where you, we learn that government can be pretty useful. Um, you know, it, who, you know we, who's providing the medical care or the coordination or all of these sort of things? So we'd be in a far, at this moment, worse position if there was no government um, so it's hard to know, and it may be different people will go different ways. Um, and but one side it may people realise government is important. The other that it may there may be a loss of trust. Um, and in a sense, both of those at times can happen together in the same people, um, because you know, you know, we are multi-dimensional and uh, have plenty of. Uh, capacity to to towards self delusion because it's not we like the will of also learned that we are resilient we learned that we are all very vulnerable so I think how that comes through and um, in culture and um, will be interesting but you know uh, yeah I don't know I'm, I reckon they'll all be there in some form or other there's no, there, there, there's no doubt about that. I want to turn the conversation a, a, a little bit. I guess this is about as optimistic as we can get in this uh, conversation. <laughs> that oh, okay, uh, we get through, <clears throat> we, we get through this one uh, on, on bubble gum and duct tape and a lick and a prayer gets us through this shock. Talk a little bit about recovering from shocks, particularly in complex societies. So on May 1st, uh, they announced in Austin, Texas, okay, uh, go back to your restaurants, go back to your bars, go back to enjoying your, your live music, pretend that none of this ever happened. Uh, t talk to us about recovering from from one shock and, and 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 how that gets harder to do each time, particularly in a complex society. Okay. Well, there is, and this is, you know, there's now quite a lot of research on it. One of the early, or about, about people have been looking for early warning signals for catastrophic system failure. Now, not. 
necessarily for society or civilization in all sorts of complex systems, in nature and society. And one of the things, if we think of a way of thinking about it, is um, what happens, that's probably a pretty uh, on point, what happens if you get ill? You know, we have bodies, they have a, a homeostatic system for you know, controlling temperature. Also, we get ill or we get injured and the body self-heals. Um, and this we can see as the body's resilience, the body's ability to absorb shocks of various sorts. But if you're already ill, so if you see like, or in a degraded state, so for example, um, the coronavirus is particularly uh, lethal if you're older, if you're a smoker, for example. So in other words, if you already have um, issues, it can be harder to recover from, or it can be slower. Your body has to do a lot more work to retain or return to its equilibrium of normal operation. And that's seen in a lot of society, in a lot of uh, complex systems. And there's this tendency near phase transition or near a tipping point or near a collapse, whatever you want to call it, call it um, that as shocks happen, it gets harder and harder to return to normal. It takes longer to return to normal. Um, and why is that? Well, we can th think of it in two sides. One is you're losing or it's losing internal resilience. So it's been too battered or too twisted and it's what was once before would have allowed it to return to normal operation now becomes harder and slower. And the other thing is external resilience. Well, um, you know, we can think of this in terms of a society or a region. You know, if there is, let's say there was a major flooding, I mean, catastrophic flooding in Thailand, which there was, I think, in 2010. Um, how does that recover? What's its resilience? Well, part of the resilience is, is within Thailand. Can it bring resources? Can it move people out? Uh, can it, does it have the financial resources, the medical resources, the logistics resources to deal with? But we also know Thailand sits in a broader world. So, you know, there's external resilience and part of Thailand's integration with the world is that the world comes and it you know, the IMF might provide financing help or stability for its currencies, etc. Um, the Red Cross sends help, other countries sell help. That's the external resilience. So if you think of two things, both of those are operating, you get a shock, and if you're already shocked or already in a bad state, it can be harder to return to normal. Um, and also, and this is going to be the case with the coronavirus, um, you know, the, the support we get from an external shock, actually the external is all suffering in all sorts of ways as well. There's not so much outside help. Um, so I think you know, what happens after recovery, it becomes harder. And also you become more vulnerable to another shock. So if I were to ask you, are we likely, forget just the coronavirus impacts and the financial system impacts, are we more likely to have some sort of climate shock next year, this year? We are, just because we know where the trends are going. Um, or is there more likely to be um, a major cyber attack? Well, on average, it's more likely to be a major cyber attack. Why? Because global tensions are increasing and we're increasingly have uh, our infrastructure is more tied together. So we've got that as well. Um, so and probably a myriad other things that, that uh, one could imagine. But the point being is, you know, you're trying to get out of this coronavirus situation, which I think is going to be very deep, you know, because it's hitting so many different parts of the economy and it's already stressed, as I said. Um, but you also become much more vulnerable to the next from, from wherever it comes. And, you know, that sort of contrast, um, and then on the external side, well, 
you know, when we had global financial crisis in 2007, 8, um, especially it hit the Eurozone, it hit the United States, one of the things that helped us kind of pick up a bit was that China went in a credit binge and said, we'll buy, we, we want to buy your stuff. We want to buy your German bits and your America that and your Australian commodities. And it was kind of a crutch up. Just getting that bit of a hand um, to help recover. That's part of the external resilience. We don't have that so much anymore. So if something, uh, th this is not a good time for another for another uh, shock to hit. It's not, but it's more likely to. Yeah, that, 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 that's all we that's all we need right now, David. Is uh, what well, you know. So we're going into the summer of 2020. Uh, I'm hearing a little bit of whispers about uh, about El Nino. I mean, this could be these. You know, as soon as while we're still dealing with this or just starting to recover from this, then we have one one of these killer heat waves. Uh, you know, as soon as our healthcare system is crawling out of this hole. And and hasn't put itself back together again. And so then 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 we get a a, a killer heat wave uh, slamming into Europe or the or the southern U.S. or whatever. And, and so it would we would be less. Is it safe to say if a killer heat heat wave is to hit here in the summer of 2020? Because of coronavirus, we are going to be even less able to respond to it than we would be w w without coronavirus. I mean, that's obvious, right? Yeah, it's in all sorts of ways. So, um, yeah, it, it, if there's still part of the United States preparedness and emergency capacity is dealing with the direct and indirect consequence of coronavirus, and then you've got vast fires or heat waves, yeah, that is another, you know, pull on those resources. It also affects, you know, uh, the, you know, people's standard of living, people's, you know, and we also know that, you know, we saw the fires in California and Australia, they were both threatened critical infrastructure, which creates these big uncertainties. In other words, if a fire starts messing with, so you've got to turn off the grid, you suddenly double or triple or whatever, mu multiply the impact. And the border between whether it hits the grid or takes down the grid or not is a pretty narrow one. It might be to do with the terrain or the speed of the firefighters or the, the breakers, etc. So they sort of, we live in a world that is, you know, much more uncertainty. So, and, you know, adding one crisis, especially if it has some sort of cascading effect on the top of another crisis, um, can just be uh, too much, and especially even if you think of things like the financial system. The financial system, you know, it, it's a bubble. Uh, there is massive over-indebtedness. One way or another, something was going to prick it. It looks like the coronavirus is start and the fall in oil prices um, are starting to do the job. Um, <clears throat> but you know, if it, if there are repeated shocks, people will start to be even more fearful of the financial system, or we'll just say we're going. If if the view starts to spread, we're going down. Uh, as a broad, you know, integration society, it's very dangerous because you know people will realise that all of that, all of those stocks, all of that credit, are claims on a future that can never be delivered. In other words, you know, the reason you hold a piece of paper that says you whatever ten thousand dollars of Apple stock, for example, is that you expect someday in future you'll turn that Apple stock into money, and that money will go and buy stuff. And um, so, it's if there's an expectation of uh, global coherence, economic organisation into the future, and if people start 
really believing that, well, what we're seeing is the fragmentation and breakup of that socio-economic organisation and the confidence that all of the credit system, all of things like clay paper claims uh, may just vanish, can start to generate this sort of fear and herd behaviour that can indeed cause, start to cause the collapse of the financial system. It's just people, confidence becomes shot, these things can happen, they have their own tipping points and people can run for the exit and you can have all sorts of chaos. So, it, again, I, it needs to, I think, keep coming back to the thing is, we live in a world of growing uncertainty and heightened risk. And um, so, sort of predicting the particular becomes very difficult. Um, but what one can say in the broad is, you lose resilience, you lose adaptive capacity, and your vulnerability to shocks uh, you become more vulnerable to shocks and stresses. Um, so, you know, there's the, oh, and then those early warning signals, the one that it's harder to recover from little shocks is called critical slowing down. And then the other thing you see in all sorts of systems is growing volatility. And I think we're seeing it all around us in all sorts of ways. Our signs that systems are near a transition point or transition point. So, David, so, uh, what, what is your particular, I, I, I know people are loath to uh, make predictions because then they can come out looking foolish, uh, but, but surely you have some hazy idea, I mean, you spend your entire life uh, tr trying to uh, figure out uh, how this is going to play out. Where are we going to be? It's 2020. We keep here. Let, let's just pick out that, that magic number 2050 with everything you're explaining, uh, everything that you've said. Uh, let's, uh, let's move the clock forward to 2050. What's it going to look like uh, on, um, on this planet in 2050? Um, I, I would be absolutely and utterly amazed if a complex, organized society, the type of one we live in now, but with maybe extra toys and extra technologies or whatever, I would be absolutely astounded if something like that was existing in 2050. Um, you know, I, I just think there are too many stresses and the system is too vulnerable. I'd be very surprised if it got to 2050. At the moment, you know, and this, as I say, there's inherent uncertainties and, um, you know, I've got things wrong before, which I'll mention. Um, but, you know, I think that at a certain point, this convergence of multiple stresses through vulnerable societal systems and it that potential for generation of new stresses and shocks, for interactions, for non-linear responses, you know, will intensify and accelerate at some point more and more rapidly. That, I think, is, we're in that world now. We're in the world of, these are now real risks. This is part of the world we're living in. The coronavirus is, to my mind, uh, a big shock relative to what we've, we were used to by a long shot. But, you know, one way or another, we were in trouble anyway. So, you know, whether it was coronavirus, whether somebody decided to take down half of the U.S. grid, whether it was severe heat waves causing revolutions left, right and center and et cetera, et cetera. All of these things were in this world now anyway. So... Um, I think we have, and from the signs of like uh, critical slowing down, growing volatility, et cetera, et cetera, we say we're, we're, we're getting nearer and nearer a tipping point uh, where the system may collapse. And um, there's, so there's all, I would, all I would say is um, the risk is growing. Um, and as my focus is, we need to be prepared. And um, to a certain point, I say, we don't really have to know exactly the whens, the, the whens and why fors. We just have to think of, well, how do we do preparedness? 
So, and obviously, you see bigger risks than the coronavirus on the near-term horizon. Is that safe to say that this is not the last one of these we're going to see? Um, you see, in a way, I don't know, because I have a feeling, you know, the, the economic impact of this coronavirus, I think, will be more than most people think, um, considerably more. Um, so that's one side. Uh, I also would sort of say, well, you know, what causes a collapse of any system in the end? Is it X or Y? Well, generally, it's the system was vulnerable already in some way or another. And it could be a mixture of X, Y, Z, etc. So, you know, our societal, we are vulnerable as a society because of how we live, the complex interdependencies. We will already have a major stressor in the financial system, which if it really broke down would be globally catastrophic. That will probably be ultimately the driver of large-scale global collapse, or at least it will be an integral part of it. Um, So it's vulnerable. Now the coronavirus is affecting all through the economy and the financial system. So it could indeed be the thing that sort of sets off the cycle of destabilization and then a tipping point and then collapse. Um, or it could just be part of more of the destabilization. So, you know, I'm being, I'm being, I'm not pinning anything particular on it because I don't think that's really how complex systems work. Um, you know, and it's, it, it is one of those examples, like if a system is really vulnerable, you know, it could be a pretty small thing that tips it over the edge, you know, it, because it's so vulnerable, something that we could barely have even noticed at another time. But at one particular time, it's the thing that causes, you know, a large cascade. Okay, well, well, David Karavich, we really appreciate you spending this time uh, helping us make sense of all this, but global industrial civilization is getting ready to collapse on this camera in a couple of minutes. So as I do with all my guests, David, if you were not talking to Sam Mitchell at Collapse Chronicles for an hour, but you had a 60-second soundbite to give the mainstream media about the state of the uh, global industrial civilization in early 2020. What would your 20-second soundbite to the world sound like today to wrap this up? We're getting a lesson from coronavirus. It's a shot across our bow. We are more and more vulnerable as a society, and we face growing risks. That means as we look into the future, it may be a harder, more difficult, and uh, you know, more stressful future for all of us. We're better off working together to build our capacities to prepare for that future. And some way in it, it is not all bad, it is a way of finding, it is an adventure, it is a great challenge, it is the challenge of our time. So it is there to be grasped and... Hopefully what we're learning from the coronavirus is that indeed we are vulnerable and we're all better off prepared and looking out for each other. Okay, and with that, uh, guys, I hate to say this, we have got to wrap this up. So if you enjoyed what David had to share with us, please spend a few minutes uh, upvoting this video and please spend a few seconds... Uh, subscribing to Collapse Chronicles for more of these fine interviews from folks like David and others. But guys, we have got to wrap it up because we're getting ready to collapse. Uh, David Karovich, thank you very much for coming on here. And more importantly, thank you for your hard work and keep up the good fight. And likewise, Sam. Uh, Lovely to meet you. And indeed, uh, hello, listeners. Uh, Good luck in the months ahead. All right, well, stick around for just a minute, but right now I need to say bye, guys.